Thank you. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, my name is Jibran Ijaz, and I'm a Drupal core developer. I, I'm a Drupal developer at Previous Next. Um, I'm also a shortcut module maintainer and contact module maintainer in core, and I have uh, almost more, uh, almost 500 core commits mentioned in Drupal 8. Um, so first of all, let's start with what is cache? Anyone in the room enthusiastic enough to answer that? Yeah. Like a store. <laughs> yeah. For what? What? So, a store for what? And and why do like why do we need a store for data? Where or why? Why we need, need a store? Yes. 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 So in t t uh, uh, typical uh, software terminology, a component to store the data for the future use, which is either source heavy or too com complex to calculate. Um, and now I like it's a, as it's a it's a back end talk. I'm going to go very technical in very technical details. So. Let's start with, uh, you know, like how many types of caches are there? Uh, first of all, we have static cache. Uh, static cache refers to the concept uh, doing stuff in memory uh, when the request is happening. So the, everything uh, will be in the memory, and after the request is done, your, uh, you know, data is lost. Um, and similarly, we have persistent cache. Uh, and as name suggests, persistent cache can keep the data around across the multiple requests. Uh, with that, we get added, added complexity of expiring the data and, or invalidating the data. So here are some examples uh, how to use static cache. Uh, 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 this is Drupal 7 function, uh, a legacy function we have from Drupal 7 um, called Drupal uh, underscore static. Uh, and then we have uh, Drupal 8 object-oriented way to do that, which is uh, defining a non-static class uh, property and using that. So here's a, a code example. Everyone can see that? Yeah. Uh, here's a code example uh, for uh, using the Drupal static uh, function. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, an array of static, uh, a static array uh, in, the, in this function, and you uh, can create key, uh, key value store using your keys and retrieve them whenever you want to. So in this case, we are using the function name uh, as, a, uh, as a key uh, or the reference to the data you are going to store in the static cache. So this is uh, uh, an example of class property, uh, where data is a class property. It's a, it's a protected property. No one can access that uh, other than the, ch the children of this class. Um, and when you don't have data, you uh, com compute that, else uh, you keep that in during the request and you keep on using that. So now I'm going to talk about uh, you know, some examples of, of persistent cache and how does it work. Uh, normally, persistent cache is used in conjunction with static cache. Uh, we have uh, the static cache going. If that there is no static value, we access the stat, uh, persistent, persistent cache and get the value from there. And the stat, uh, persistent cache needs a storage, and that storage is normally uh, the cache backends. Here's an example. Uh, same. Uh, this is the modified version of the. Uh, so, so Object-oriented example of uh, 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 static cache, where you have the same property, but this time, if you don't have uh, any data from the pro in the property before calculating, you uh, query the backend and you access the data from there. And if you still don't have the data, you uh, uh, gather the new data, uh, set the back backend. It will populate your static cache as well, and then you can, uh, you know, resume your normal service. So now I'm going to talk about uh, what is cache backend. Uh, it's a storage uh, to save the uh, cache items. Um, and in core, uh, we have a bunch of different type of cache backends, like in memory, uh, where uh, you know, like name suggests uh, uh, that you are storing stuff in memory, and it's you know fancy name of static cache because memory only uh, you know can keep stuff until one request uh, until the request is terminated. Then we have uh, default storage. Uh, when you install Drupal on, uh, uh, using a database, uh, this is the normal cache you get, uh, database cache. Uh, and this bin uh, cache backend is, uh, that this cache backend is by default available when you install Drupal. Then we have APCU cache, which is uh, typically for PHP processes. 
uh, and they, they cannot share like a CLI and uh, you know UI process can cannot share their memory. So uh, so there is some limitation around that. But uh, it's uh, it's for the PHP processes uh, to have you know your their cache uh, available readily to them. And when you are developing locally, or when you want don't want to use the cache, uh, you can use null cache backend, uh, and it's, it it will disable the cache, and you you'll always have uh, to calculate the data, and it will slow your site a lot. In Contrib, uh, there are a couple of um, uh, there are a bunch of uh, so solutions. Um, I'm aware of Redis and Memcache. Uh, and I have only used Redis uh, in Drupal 8, uh, though I have used Memcache in Drupal 7. And in Drupal 8, uh, setting up Memcache is not, uh, you know, that's that trivial. But Redis is just, uh, you know, the ch one change in the configuration file, and you are good to go. And we'll discuss that in the future slide. There's another very interesting uh, backend, which is called ca Chain Fast backend, uh, and the concept behind this backend is that you can combine multiple cache backends, and if you don't have the information available in first backend, you can access the information on the other from the other backend. Uh, I will go into the detail of this uh, in next slide in in upcoming slides. Uh, but let's discuss cache bins first. What is a cache bin? It's a container uh, to store the cache entries, uh, and it's uh, it. it it is always a configurable. It always has a con configurable backend. You can change and swap the backend whenever you want to. Uh, and if you are changing, uh, you know, your storage uh, from database to Redis, for example. So this is uh, how uh, you know, like in the stat, uh, like uh, uh, in the first line, this is how you can use the bin, uh, any bin. Uh, if you don't pass the bin, it will use the default bin uh, to access the. Uh, you know some information from the uh, uh, some data from the cache cache bin using Drupal static method, and then with a container get function, uh, you can use that in the, using the dependency injection in your object-oriented code. There are multiple bins in core, uh, but by default we have uh, Bootstrap. Uh, by, by, by default, we have uh, you know, a default cache, uh, cache bin, as name suggested. It is a small bin with few key variation uh, to store you know, small amount of data. Um, and then we have a, a data bin, which is a bigger bin. You can store as much as data you want. Uh, and then uh, we have discovery, which is uh, frequently used for the plugin discovery, uh, which uh, Drupal heavily rely on. Uh, and if uh, and it speeds up Drupal a lot. Then we have uh, a small cache uh, like Bootstrap. Uh, it uh, it helps uh, you know Bootstrap the Drupal uh, and it's a small cache. It's used on every request, but it's very limited outside Drupal core. The usage of it is very limited outside Drupal core. Uh, then uh, the bigger beast render cache, uh, which has everything uh, you know a huge amount of data. Uh, because uh, you know whatever you are rendering, it gets stored in that bin. Um, configuration and cache to store the site configuration so that they are uh, readily available. If we don't have to read from the disk all the time, uh, so they are stored in the uh, you know config bins. And static cache or uh, which are using memory backend, which we already discussed, is another way to store or um, leverage uh, static methods or static cache. This is the default structure of our database table um, when you, uh, you use a cache bin, uh, where CID is the cache ID, and data is the data you store in it. Expire is the t time when the, your data is going to uh, expire. It's not the interval. It's the time. That's the most important thing here. Uh, similarly, uh, some trivial things are created when the uh, cache entry is created, serialized, whether the data is serialized or not. Um, tags, we will go into the more detail of tags, but it's uh, just for the sake of definition, it's the dependency of the data. Um, and then checksum is to invalidate the data whenever we want to. This is how you define your custom bin, uh, cache bin. Uh, in your code, uh, it's just uh, Drupal provides you everything. 
uh, you just have to you know change your argument name and uh, have a proper uh, service name uh, and you can uh, call the factory service and it will provide you the storage and all the getter and setter methods so we talk, uh, talked about overriding briefly uh, there, this is how you can override uh, your bin properly uh, in settings.php normally uh, and the first example shows you that uh, we are going to use uh, Redis for uh, the default storage instead of database. So um, I have done that uh, on multiple client sites and I have seen a huge performance boost, but uh, Redis come with uh, additive cost of configuration and maintenance. Um, it's, it's, it's a standalone service. It can be a standalone service. It can encompass in your web hosting solution as well. Um, so uh, th this is, uh, you know, uh, it, this, is, this module has quite stable, quite few stable releases and it's uh, doing really great with the community. Um, and then uh, the example below is for the developers when you want to uh, build your template or your theme and you don't want to render, uh, you don't want a render cache so that uh, you don't have to clear cache again and again while you are changing your theme. Uh, and updating your settings. So uh, th here's an example from Core uh, for the usage of cache fast backend. Um, for, uh, in the JSON API module, uh, first we declare uh, a memory cache backend uh, dedicated uh, to the uh, JSON API usage, uh, which is a private uh, service, and because it's not getting uh, going to be used uh, as a you know public service so we may as as a, as a declare as a, as a private and then uh, as you can see there are two calls to append backend and it shows that we have like two cascading backends working together um, and the data first uh, when we will request the data from this bin um, we will get the first json uh, api memory cache bin request and if there is nothing in the memory uh, on that request, we will go to their database, uh, or the, in, in this case, default bin, and we will get uh, information from there. Or if not, then we will rebuild that information. So this is really useful and sp uh, uh, speeding up uh, JSON API uh, discovery for the resources whenever you access a JSON endpoint, uh, because uh, you have, uh, during, the mem uh, during the request, you are storing the cache in the, uh, uh, in the memory, and once your cache, uh, your request is terminated, you still have the response in, in the database, and you can still populate your uh, memory from that and then keep on doing that. Uh, and this slight change, this patch has increased the JSON API speed 3x time uh, in core, which Dries uh, also mentioned in his keynote that JSON API is faster than ever in Drupal 8.8. Here's a simple example of deletion. Uh, you can, uh, if you have like simple key available to you, you can just go ahead and delete that. But uh, rep, we usually don't uh, do that. Uh, we, uh, because uh, there are other ways. We, we have cache tags, which we'll discuss in, uh, in the later part of the presentation. Uh, but there's an API available if you want to directly delete certain things uh, from the cache uh, bin. Uh, if you know the key, just use that or just you know delete everything. Uh, it has uh, the benefit of using that because uh, we can, it, it's a little overhead because with tags you have the all computation going in the background, whereas delete is a direct call to delete stuff. Similar to uh, deletion, there's invalidation. Invalidation doesn't delete the data, it keeps the data, but it, uh, on, the, uh, on the next request, uh, if the data is required, it will regenerate the data and populate the cache. So it's, uh, it's you know, the hasty way of, yeah, I, this data is obsolete uh, in the next request or, the, uh, or whenever we, I, we need this data, let's rebuild after a while. Um, and uh, there are like a very complex uh, API system uh, in place to invalidation uh, for the invalidation of multiple cache backends um, for this. Um, here, here's an ex another example of expiration. Uh, you can s like uh, set the time limit uh, as we discussed in the table structure. Uh, it's a timestamp, so 86, 400. Uh, mean uh, that 
uh, it's a whole day, the number of seconds in the day, and request time is the current time. So it, it's caching for the one day, and after that, it will discard the data. Uh, and if, similarly, if you want to uh, keep the data till midnight, uh, you can just use you know, PHP functions to give you the timestamp for that. The next thing is cache tag. Cache tag is the dependency of the cache data like ent uh, entities and configuration. Uh, they can also be custom uh, tags as well. Um, normally, uh, Drupal is responsible of uh, inval uh, invalidating or uh, clearing the uh, you know tags for uh, invalidating the tags for entity and config. But if you are using custom tags, you have to do it uh, by you by yourself. So how does uh, all uh, all of this you know come into play? Like, why are we going into this detail? Uh, uh, of learning the Drupal cache and the cache bins because we uh, use that rapidly with the rendered array. Uh, so, so before stepping into the rendered arrays, do you, do you need some water? You have some water. <laughs> do you need some water? Oh, that, that's all right. <laughs> Yeah, so, so let's discuss uh, render arrays uh, quickly. Um, in Drupal, uh, render array is the way to represent uh, your render page in an uh, in a array format. Um, this is how a node render array look like when you call a view builder to sh display your full, full mode. Uh, it, as you can see, there is, it's a complex structure. It has a view mode configuration. It has a node object and then a cache key. We will go into detail of, of, of this cache key in a bit, and it will start making sense of uh, all of this. <laughs> so render uh, caching is the most important thing in core. Uh, the render process has the ability to cache render output at any level in a render array uh, or in the hierarchy. And the render, array, uh, render API use cacheability metadata, um, and it, uh, embedded in the render array to perform the caching. So let's quickly uh, discuss, uh, uh, let's in detail discuss cacheability metadata. Uh, so first we have cache key. Uh, this is used to identify the cacheable portion of the render array. Uh, then we have cache tags. Uh, this is for the dependencies on the data managed by Drupal like uh, you know, uh, like config, uh, entities or configurations. Um, then we have cache context, uh, the variation uh, in the output based on the different context of the request. Uh, and then we have max age, uh, which is uh, uh, for the time sensitive uh, you know, information. Uh, when is data go get going to expire or when we have to regenerate the data? Cache key. Um, uh, as you can see, uh, we, the biggest question for us in the render array uh, when we are cre creating a render array is that whether my data is cacheable or not. Uh, it, it do, it, is it complex enough to cache that data or not? And, um, and then uh, we uh, identify the relevant part uh, which can you know, identify as cache keys. Uh, in this example, uh, these keys are uh, explaining you that what and which type of thing uh, we are, uh, you know, talking about in caching. So, entity we are going to uh, uh, view an entity which is a node, uh, and its NID is one, and the view mode we are going to use is full. So, uh, we have all the information, and we can go back and regenerate the render array using that information as well. Cache context. Uh, does my output has variation like based on user location, based on uh, based on you know their authentication, like it, it, whether they are logged in or logged out, uh, based on the uh, tr translation I'm viewing, like it's a different language or not? Um, we can have a different uh, rendered output for everything uh, uh, based on the, all these contexts. Uh, by default, uh, we have theme context because every site has a theme, and then we have language interface uh, to make sure the default language uh, is enabled on the site. 
uh, and if you are uh, anonymous uh, user, uh, you will have user per uh, permission. Uh, uh, and when you are authenticated user, you can swap that with the user um, context as well. But normally, it's user permission by default. Here's an example of uh, the context available for this node. And as you can see, there are a lot of them. Uh, but it's true that uh, any of these uh, can change and change the render output based on that as well. Uh, it can be a multilingual site. It, uh, you, are, you might be viewing it uh, at a different location where time is different, or you are, you are viewing it in admin theme or you know, on the front end. So based on that, uh, render output can change a lot. Um, cache uh, tags, uh, these are the dependencies as we discussed before, um, but, but more likely we can say that uh, the things we need uh, the, to regenerate, uh, like the things identify when to regenerate our data. Um, and in this case, uh, like if file has changed because we are viewing any file or our taxonomies are showing on the node, um, if anything gets updated, uh, we need to uh, uh, you know, refresh the cache of this because uh, a username might uh, get changed or taxonomy term get, uh, gets updated and, and that will render our output uh, invalidated and we have to um, get the fresh uh, uh, rendered output uh, so that we can use the new values which has been updated uh, in the backend. Then uh, MagSage, which is very interesting and uh, complex idea that uh, to, it, it is to make sure that we are expiring our data pr properly. Uh, core rapidly use uh, uh, permanent cache, uh, which is minus one. Make sure everything is cached all the time. <laughs> we, don't, uh, we don't need to you know, uh, expire things based on time. And then we have uh, uncacheable stuff. So either core, most of the time, core is using minus one or zero. Uh, in the most cases, either we cache things or either we don't cache things. But in real life uh, development, you can set it to the specific seconds and time. Uh, like, uh, you know, you can set it uh, to six hours, uh, something like that. So this is uh, the duration and, and seconds. Uh, this is not a timestamp. So the Drupal will do the con conversion when it will convert the data from um, MaxSage to um, the, uh, the, the values we store in the database table. This is how it all looks like when we store uh, our data. Um, as you can see that cache, uh, CRD is comp uh, comprised of cache key, uh, which we have uh, seen earlier, and then all the user, uh, con uh, all the context available uh, to, to that uh, render array. And they are all serialized, and they, they form a, a, a cache ID. Um, and then markup is uh, stored, or uh, yeah, in, in this case, markup is stored in the data. Um, and we, as, as I said, the cache, <laughs> Drupal uses you know, cache permanent or uncacheable uh, everywhere. So in this case, expiry is minus one, and tags are just coming through as a tag, and then we have checksum to make sure we can invalidate the data when we can. Let's talk about bubbling up the cache metadata. Um, in Drupal, uh, bubbling, uh, bubble, uh, bubbles mean that all the cacheability metadata uh, uh, along the render uh, uh, you know, elements. Uh, by, uh, let's start from the top. It's, it's a really complex uh, concept. And uh, in Drupal 8, bubbles, uh, Drupal, Drupal 8 technically bubbles all the cacheability metadata up along the render tree. When it reaches the tree, is root, it bubbles to the response level as well. So uh, the idea is that uh, each and every um, element on the page uh, is responsible uh, for its own uh, cache metadata. But uh, during the process of the rendering, we will bubble at each and everything uh, to the top. Uh, and then once that's done, we will send it via response to the uh, reverse proxy or uh, you know, the user browser. And once this is all done, because that's all the you know, development side, once that's done, what's the benefit of that? That's, the benefit of that is page caching. 
uh, we can cache the pages. Uh, so there are, are two solutions uh, in core. Uh, one is internal page cache, uh, which was you know, the default cache in Drupal 7. Um, the, uh, this is the cache for the anonymous users. Um, it, has the, uh, it has the URL uh, key uh, as a cache ID key and, and, as an, and cache key and cache ID as well, um, so that we can you know, relate the response back to whatever the URL is. Uh, and it does support the cache tags. We can invalidate the response based on the cache tag as well. Um, and also, internal page does not support uh, cache context because we are using just straight URL with this parameter, and we are not relying on any other information. Um, it does not support MaxSage as well. Uh, and that's, there is an open issue. We will discuss that at the end of the presentation, uh, why this is an, there is an open issue, and we are not able to solve that. But uh, it's, even though you can not use MaxSage, but you can send expired headers, and uh, you know you will, the uh, page cache will get expired. So there is a, a added complexity on uh, on top of the design. Uh, but it's, uh, we will see why it's there. Um, but the, for now, you can send expired header, and it will expire your internal page cache. And because you are storing against the URL. Uh, so the cache uh, is just uh, storing the response object as it is. It doesn't care, uh, and it's, it, it's, it can be just the markup uh, as a string. Uh, it can be uh, you know, whatever response you are showing on the page. Uh, so uh, you, uh, this is the reason uh, the page cache is so fast that uh, you access the you, you query the URL. Uh, Drupal goes uh, to the page cache table, looks for the URL, and if the URL is there, just returns everything whatever is in the data column. Then we have dynamic page cache that uh, we built in Drupal 8, uh, and it's a very you know fascinating concept, uh, and it's uh, really uh, hard to grasp at the beginning, but once you realize, uh, it's really uh, uh, easy to understand. Um, it doesn't cache full pages, unlike uh, you know page cache. It it caches part of or the fragments of the page, and then if something is uncacheable or varies with the time, you can cache that separately and uh, just put a placeholder in, uh, there. And Drupal uh, will be responsible for replacing the placeholder during the render processing uh, process. And uh, these all cache metadata, which we went into very detail, uh, uh, cache tag, co cache context, and max age, they are all supported by page, dynamic page cache. And in fact, cache context was introduced so that we can uh, use that in a dynamic page cache. Um, uh, it, uh, as you have seen, that page, uh, 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 internal page cache was only for anonymous user. Uh, whereas dynamic page cache, because we have the context information, uh, we can vary the output based on the context, and uh, it will work for every user uh, on this website. And because we are not using, uh, saving this response object as, uh, as such, uh, we, are, uh, we are storing just a fragment of uh, the response. Uh, it, that's why it's relatively s uh, slower than the internal page cache. But uh, we are uh, doing more stuff like uh, setting up the cache tag, cache con uh, you know, ca changing the context, setting up the max age, uh, so that uh, in the long run, not just anonymous user, all the users of the website will benefit. So, so there's a complexity uh, in s setting all these things up. Uh, there is a complexity as sending the response out, but once these are all done, uh, the end product uh, is so good that you, know, you cannot ignore this. Here's a simple table uh, to uh, compare uh, in internal page cache with the dynamic page cache. Uh, in, in, on, in internal page cache, uh, our cache ID is URL, where the dynamic page cache, we have uh, URL and the context, as we have seen in the example. Uh, and then we, uh, we have the data in, in internal page cache. The data is the final response. We want to show it to end user. Um, and for dynamic page cache, it's partial response with a placeholder, which will get replaced during the render, rendering process. And they both support cache tags, and we uh, can invalidate these with the cache tags. 
So let's talk about reverse proxies. What's, what's a reverse proxy, anyone? Yeah, so a proxy server that retrieves a resource on the behalf of the client from one or more servers, right? So if it's one or more servers, then it's a CDN, uh, and, and you can declare, uh, have your own proxy server, like uh, in case of example, we do, uh, in case of varnish, we do that. So uh, let's discuss quickly about Drupal and reverse proxies. Uh, we have page cache, which is uh, called a poor man's varnish because it is just storing the whole response with a, uh, the, uh, for, for a given URL. And varnish essentially you know, uh, doing that at the same level with an added complexity of tags and whatnot. But uh, it, it's a, it's, it's suffice to say that we, uh, it's a poor man's varnish. Uh, and if you are uh, just hosting your website, uh, you can just enable dynamic page cache and uh, uh, internal page cache, and you're good to go. You don't need a dedicated reverse proxy uh, or whatnot. And you can, um, you know, of course, use a solution like Fastly or Cloudflare, uh, Cloudfront, uh, or, or even Varnish. Uh, but when, when you do that, uh, they are Sim uh, simply mimicking the functionality which is uh, internal page cache providing. So you have to uh, disable that uh, so that uh, you can you know, get the benefit of uh, having the reverse proxy or the CDNs. So all this uh, sums up into uh, you know, like a, a, a lot of burden to developers, like uh, how, what and how we have to do these things and, uh, and what things we have to uh, achieve the, to do that, and then uh, for this, I'm go quickly going to discuss developer tools. Um, first of all, uh, while you are locally do uh, developing, enable your settings.local.php so that you can um, see the errors properly instead of wide screen of death. Uh, set your uh, header uh, of debug cacheability uh, so that you can uh, see the cacheability data coming through in your response. Uh, and you can see that whether it's you, uh, your request has been cached or not. And then there's a great module called RenderWiz. Uh, it's just like a themer. If you have used themer in D7, uh, themer is for the theme, uh, but RenderWiz is for the render pipeline, and it gives you uh, a full view of each and a, uh, every element on the page with their cacheability and cacheability metadata so that you can go and point out where the things are getting uncached uh, or why are they get, oh, being not cached properly? And then here is the qu a quick test. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, like you can normally, uh, that, that's what we normally do on the website, right? We go to the site, refresh the page, and uh, we uh, see that, that after the first request, there is uh, a cached response coming. So in, in this example, as you can see, we, uh, as, uh, we go to the, uh, user homepage as an editor after the login. And in first request, we assume that uh, there will be a cache miss. And once that's done, uh, we just uh, get a cache hit. And if that test is failing, you can just simply add this in your uh, you know, CI CD pipeline. And once uh, they are there, you can make sure that all the changes uh, you are doing to your code are not rendering your page uncacheable. So I'm going to quickly discuss about some of the issues uh, which were I underlined um, in the uh, in the uh, presentation. Uh, one of them is bubbling of max cache. Right now, uh, surprise, surprise, we have this amazing API, but we don't bubble uh, anything with regards to time. So here's the link uh, to this issue. If you are interested, you can view that link and read the story and back history. I, I will briefly go into the detail. Um, we have. Uh, the title is bubbling of the element max cache to page header and uh, headers and page cache. Um, you know, it is postponed by three issues right now. We cannot uh, finish that issue, um, and I'll get into the reason why this postponed. But you know, here's a simple statement that uh, as a user, I have a weather block on my website. I want to update the weather uh, after every 15 minutes for all the user. Uh, there is no way in Drupal to do that at the moment. A simple solution is a mod contrib module, uh, which was, uh, you know, technically inherited by 
uh, this patch we were working on, but this patch is blocked on other stuff. So this, this is a, you know, uh, yeah, this is uh, just providing you a small gap uh, to fix, the, uh, fix it uh, temporarily, which will, uh, you know, the module name is cache control override. It just uh, gives you the ability to pick up the message uh, and set up that properly. Like if it's 15 minutes for a block and then for the whole page, the message will be 15 minutes. But it has some limitation as well, which are listed here. And these are all the issues which, are, which this issue is blocked on. Um, and as you can see, like they are uh, really like very vast issues, uh, some of them, and some of them are very specific. Uh, sorry? Yes. <laughs> and then uh, optimizing render cache, like it's a very broad issue. Of, uh, <laughs> what is an optimization of render cache? So, so the, the problem is, and the crux of the problem is Drupal is showing too, uh, way too many elements on the page and we still don't uh, haven't, uh, have a way to identify on the page that uh, the, how is this thing a cacheable thing or not. And if this is not cacheable, just exclude that from the response and not in include that, which is the language uh, a switcher block, which this should not be cached at all because uh, your contact, uh, language negotiator is responsible of setting the value and you can change the value based on uh, you know, your choice as a user uh, if it's a multilingual site. Then the last issue, it's, it's, an, it's an, another, another interesting one issue uh, which is about bundle specific tags. Right now, uh, here's the link and this is the title of the tag, introduce um, entity underscore type list, uh, underscore list call them bundle cache tags and add the single bundle listing. The reason behind that is uh, we, in core, we have the listing tag for all the entities like node underscore list, taxonomy underscore list, and all the listing pages, as we know, Drupal loves this, having listing. Uh, for all the listing pages, we have this one tag, and if the one node on the page is getting updated, it will render the response uh, and validate the, uh, uh, the render cache, and we have to uh, you know, recalculate. Uh, for every one node. So this is just making sure, so this is the problem statement, just explaining that like uh, if I have a view or I have a listing page where I'm showing uh, multiple nodes, uh, you know, it's not feasible for me to save, just save one node and invalidate all the listing on the site. Um, so we are just changing the scope to have a bundle specific tag so that node colon page underscore listing will be our tag uh, once uh, it's a page listing, we make sure we are just rendering uh, the page listing. Uh, we are just invalidating the page listing, not just the whole uh, you know, thing. So we have just limited the scope. Uh, we are not doing any views changes in this. We are just uh, providing the API to begin with. Uh, and this, um, and, uh, which is you know, another uh, listing tag on top of node list. Uh, and we will add the node list if there will be multiple bundles on the page. If not, uh, it's just a page listing or it's just a article listing, we will just provide the node underscore list underscore page uh, tag or node underscore list under colon uh, article tag. And th this patch is in fairly good shape in core. Um, at, uh, right now, it's just pending on a unit test, and if someone wants to help with that, uh, you know, they can, uh, uh, you know, come to me and talk to me, and we can finish this off uh, during this, uh, this Drupal South. Uh, so I would like to thank you all, uh, but most of the all, uh, Wim Leers, who is, you know, the mind behind all this complex API. <laughs> and he has written so much documentation and all, all this is available in very detail uh, on drupal.org. Uh, and there are very good blog posts available uh, on Vim's website about that as well. Uh, Berdia did a session uh, in Drupal Dev Days uh, like a couple of years ago uh, that uh, helped me a lot in preparing this session, uh, how to you know, keep the things in check. So thank you to Berdia. Um, and of course, previous next day, you know, sponsored my visit uh, trip to come over here, uh, and Drupal South to, for giving me uh, the op opportunity to speak with you. So, any questions?
Thanks, Gibran. We got uh, five minutes for the question, so I'm sure we got plenty. I'll probably start the conversation, so start something simple. Uh, can you explain in a nutshell what's the difference between doing Drush cache clear and Drush cache rebuild and what's actually happening in the back end? What get, gets cleared and not when you run those two commands? So cache clear only exists in Drupal 7 and it's not in Drupal 8. Cache rebuild is in Drupal 8. There is cache clear in Drupal 8 as well. No. If you run that, it will give you error. Yes, there is. I'll, I'll show you. <laughs> but for cache, ca cache clear, you cannot run by itself. So it's just, uh, it doesn't really matter. But uh, to answer your actual question, uh, it, they just rename the command. So cache clear is called cache rebuild in Drupal 8. That's the only change. But uh, in the back, uh, back end, what we do is we just invalidate all the caches. Uh, we clear all the back ends available. Uh, other than uh, you know your reverse proxies or CDNs that you have to do uh, you know the other way using other utilities in the CLI, so Drupal uh, just goes in and queries uh, you know truncate blah 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 kind of thing uh, to the cache tables if we are you know talking more simply. So when you clear a cache, it basically invalidates all the caches. Uh, yes, yes. Every everything uh, which has implemented hook cache clear. Uh, it, that was in D7, but yeah, uh, in D8, that is uh, not the case, so yes, everything. All right, thanks. Any other questions? Raise your hand. Hi, um, I just wanted to understand the difference, like why would you delete a cache versus invalidating it? Because if it gets invalidated, it gets rebuilt anyway, right? So I, just, I, I don't know why you would invalidate rather than deleting. Yeah, so, so uh, in, invalidating, as I said, there's a subtle difference, right? Delete means it's gone, right? Invalidate it means that, uh, you know, we are just leaving it there, and when we need to rebuild, we will recalculate it, right? But, but, but once you invalidate it, it's, it means rebuild on the next request, right? Uh, th that means when it, it is required, we will rebuild it. But still, uh, during the, that process, whatever your response you have gotten from the cache bin, you can use that be, uh, as an outdated right, right. response, yes. Yeah. So, so that, there is the subtle difference between those. Anyone else? So have you shown? Yeah, there, yeah, yeah there, there is cache clear in Drupal, in Drush 8, so check it out. It's actually, you have to target a specific thing. So you have specifically theme registry, uh, router, CSS, JS, render, plugin, bin, and views. You can do with cache clear. Okay. Whereas, uh, yeah, but yeah. cache rebuild would rebuild the whole cache. So I was just wondering, is there a specific targeting? Because sometimes with, if you still use features, with cache clear, a feature might get uninstalled. I guess there's a bug in features, but cache, ca when you do cache rebuild, but cache clear would get the feature back. Okay. That's why I was wondering what actually fundamentally different between those two commands in Drush, latest Drush. Yeah, so that's not latest Drush. Latest Drush is, uh, latest Drush is Drupal uh, Drush 10. Uh, yeah. And Drush 9, yeah, I, I have been using Drush 9 for a year and a half. And I haven't used Drush 8. But I can have a look uh, after the session. But, okay, yeah. cool. Thanks. Um, I, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm interested in it. Is that well? Like, what is it? Anyone else? So, in terms of reverse proxies, do, what what else do we need to do to make it work properly? Like, aside from clearing the reverse proxy cache. Yeah. So, uh, like, there is the very thorough do uh, documentation about varnish available on Drupal.org. Uh, which will work with the cache tags uh, solution implemented in Drupal. Uh, but all you have to do is, you know, enable your dynamic page cache, disable your internal page cache, uh, make sure whenever, what, whenever you are doing the rendering process or creating a render array, add the proper cache stability dependencies. As a developer, that's your only responsibility, and the rest will be, you know, handled. Uh, because they are doing the same thing. Reverse proxy and internal page cache is doing the same thing. Because page, internal page cache is storing the response for the URL, uh, and it's the complete response. And varnish is, in a nutshell, is the same thing. We have the URL and then the response of the URL. But effectively, uh, like if we have internal page cache st still turned on, and we have a varnish before our web server, 
it like the cache version will never be hit because it would be served by varnish. Is that correct? So, so norm. So this is like a very. Uh, so this all cache cycle of how to get the actual data and which point we are getting the actual data. That's very complex to follow. But uh, in this certain example, if you have varnish enabled and then page cache enabled and maybe dynamic page cache enabled as well, by default it's enabled on standard. So let's assume that. And then you have entity cache and uh, you know like and render cache as well. So 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 what would happen in this scenario if you keep this enable that varnish has a page which is the certain page and uh, you uh, are getting that copy right uh, as a, as an end user. I have changed something in, in Drupal and updated my node, right? And w what it would do is uh, it will uh, render my entity cache obsolete, right? Invalidate that, and then it will rebuild uh, my entity cache and render cache both. Uh, sorry, and then going forward, if, uh, it will also use the dynamic page cache because a dynamic page cache has might have fragments of that node, right? Um, and when you go to internal page cache and the varnish end, uh, the internal page cache is just Drupal cache. Uh, it, it will invalidate that. If you have a tagging solution in place for varnish, it will do uh, the invalidation there as well. If not, then it will keep the copy. So for the end user, the change will not occur, but for the Drupal, the change will occur. And then when the max age for the varnish will uh, you know, uh, lapse, then it will get the refresh copy, which is the internal page cache copy, which is also not refreshed now, uh, fresh now because you know we fetched that a while back. So you are just adding a, another store behind a store when you enable that. Do you uninstall the module or just set it to zero? Yeah, just install, install it, yeah. Still not clear? No, but it feels like a configuration problem, right? If you haven't invalidated the environment cache. Mm. So, so there is a very good uh, blog post by Wim Lears about that, uh, where he is going into detail uh, why dynamic page cache is enabled by default in core, uh, why we have added and, uh, and separated uh, internal page cache, because in D7 it was just in the system, small setting in the systems module. Uh, you go to you know, cache clear page and you enable 7 or 6 or something like that. And now you have to enable a module to get that you know, configuration. So why, why there is a thinking behind that? So, so there are a couple of good uh, VMDS blog posts about that. It might clear your confusion there. All right, let's thank Gibran. Thank you. Don't forget, you can go to the website now and leave your feedback. Please do that.